Okay, uh, last in the last lecture we finished the first topic, which was uh, about. Yes, uh, we were discussing the breakdown conditions. Okay, uh, we discussed or we saw the examples for two of the conditions. The first condition was if there are two highways merging into a third segment, and uh, the breakdown is due to a ramp or a number of ramps. Okay, and uh, I told you whenever we have a breakdown, uh, then there are two things which are important: Q and delay. Okay, and the last example we looked at the concept of uh, bottleneck, hidden bottleneck, and demand establish. Okay, obviously you guys don't remember, but we did this. Okay, yes, trust me. Okay, then we started with the uh, second topic, which is about traffic data collection. Okay, so. Hmm. We looked at the points, why do we need traffic data? So we need traffic data to see the current state of the system, uh, how many people are using the system, and what can happen in the future. And then uh, we discussed a point that before you start collecting the data, you should know your purpose, and you should know your uh, calculations, your analysis which you are going to perform on the data. Otherwise, your efforts can be wasted. And uh, we also talked about that traffic does not only mean vehicles, it can mean much more, okay? It can mean other types of travelers as well, which are not in the vehicles. Then what are the sources of data? Uh, we have some sources which are available through the government. They are uh, being uh, made open access for everybody to use in some cases, not in all cases. Uh, if you have to collect your own data, then you can do it manually. Okay, there are some devices which you can use uh, uh, manually. Then there are some detectors which you can install on the road, and they will collect the data for you automatically. And then you can use video-based measurements as well. And then there are other smart devices which can be used for collecting the data, such as your smartphones. So their main purpose is not data collection, but they can be used. So these are some of the counters which can be used for traffic data collection. Uh, what are the applications of traffic data? We use traffic data for managing the current system, uh, maintenance needs, construction needs, future projects, all this comes under uh, managing the physical system. Uh, we use traffic data to establish the growth trend of traffic and then see what will happen in the future. Uh, we use traffic data to understand the behavior of the travelers. We will discuss about it today as well. Uh, we use traffic data to calibrate the equations, the functions, the models. And, and this is what we did in the last uh, uh, chapter. We can use traffic data to see if the improvements on the road are effective or not. Okay, We call them follow-up studies. Uh, we can use traffic data to assess the impacts of new developments, new housing projects, new malls, what will happen if you build a new mall in this area, what will happen to traffic, what will happen to environment. So these are uh, assessing the potential impacts and then the last one, well, evaluating the performance of the highway system, the highway network, okay, uh, which segments have more problems, which segments have more delay, more congestion and so on. Okay, moving forward, these are the types of studies which we will discuss today. Okay, but these are not the only types of studies, there are other studies as well. Okay, these are the ones which we are discussing in this chapter. Okay, we have already talked about volume, right? What is volume? One hour a day. What? Liters per unit time, and that time is usually per hour or per day. Okay. And the examples which we did in the last, in the end of the last chapter, the last topic. When demand increases, what happens to volume? Huh? Increases, right? Okay. So if you see volume increasing on the highway, 
that is that is an indication that the demand is also increasing, right? Okay, so it's an indicator. Volume is an indicator of the demand. So where do we use volume? We use volume for planning. Okay, we use volume for design, traffic control, traffic operations, scheduling, signal timing, and all these. Among all these applications, which are written in the second point, which one uses daily volume? Well, the points which is which are written in the second statement. Uh, in which one do we use daily volume? Daily volume. Planning. Okay, we use daily volume for planning, future projections. Okay, for the rest of the applications, I need. Hourly work, design, management, operation, signal timing. In all these cases, I need daily work. Okay. Yes, you have. You have. Oh, sorry. And as for the application, I need hourly work. Sorry. sorry. For planning, I need daily work, or I use daily work. For the rest of the applications, I use hourly work for design, for operations, for signal timing. In all these cases, I use hourly work. Use hourly volume. Okay. If you don't have hourly volume, you will calculate it from daily. But in the end, you need hourly for the rest of the things. Clear? Okay. So most of the applications need hourly volume. Hourly volume is more common use. Clear? Okay. Then we have speed studies. Speed is related to safety. How? How a speed is related to safety? Limits the drivers to a certain speed. Sorry. Limits the drivers to a speed. No, no. How a speed is related to safety? Yes, we limit the travel to certain speed. But what effect? What is the effect of a speed on safety? What is the speed? How? Why? They have less control. They have less control. Yes. So a speed will reduce your control. Okay, anything else? High speed motor. Uh, Why? Control. It is true. Yes. Why? It is related to control and one more thing, which is what? Reduce the space between the reaction time. Reaction time. Yes. Higher speed gives you less time to react. Something suddenly comes on the on the road because you have high speed, you have less time to react. Okay, something is let's say 100 meters away from you, you are going at 50 kilometers per hour, you have more time to react as compared to if you are going at 100 kilometers per hour, right? So it gives you less time to react. And what else? Anything else? So less control, less time to react, and this is related to uh, how the accidents happen, right? You didn't have time, you didn't have control. But if the accident happens, then what is the role of the speed now? Huh? That's all done. Okay, they were required to stop. They didn't stop. Now the accident happened. Now what is the effect of the speed when the accident happens? Yes, the accident is more serious at high speed, right? So whatever the reason of the accident was, now the accident has happened. Which accident will be more serious? The one which has happened at high speed or low speed? High speed. High speed, right? So accident affects both occurrence of accident and severity of accident, seriousness of accident. Okay? At high speed, the chances of accidents are higher. And if the accident happens at high speed, then it, it is it is supposed to be more severe as compared to accidents which happen at low speed. Got it? Okay. So speed is related to both uh, aspects of accident. Yeah. So what do we need to why do we do speed studies? We need to make sure that our speed regulations are rational. Whatever speed regulations we are enforcing on the drivers, they are rational. 
meaning according to the environment in which the driver is. The speed regulation should be according to that. Okay? So if you are on a local street with one lane, no shoulders, there are houses on both sides of the street, and you put a speed limit of 100. Okay. Doesn't make any sense, right? Huh? Okay, and the reverse, you have three lane road, shoulders, very wide, straight, and you put a speed limit of 50. Okay? I can see the difference. Huh? Some were smiling at 100, some were smiling at 50. Huh? They have different choices, right? Different scenarios in mind, what you see, what seems as funny, right? Anyway, good. But you get the point, right? Yeah. Hmm? The speed regulation should be according to the expectation of the driver. Okay? And uh, if the drivers, why do the drivers go, uh, why do the drivers uh, do over speeding? Because they feel they can manage, right? Okay? So in such cases, then you need to manage the expectation of the driver. So, we put something to manage the driver. Put a speed hump, put a speed camera, and so on. Clear? Clear? Okay. Then we have travel time studies. I mentioned in the last chapter as well, whenever we talk about speed, we'll also talk about travel time. High speed travel time is? Yes. Okay? It's less, right? Everybody agrees? Okay. But I don't know what is happening in science. Huh? It can be something new in physics. The speed increase, the travel time of increase. It's not right. It's not like this, right? Not until now. Okay. So, we are doing a speed study, right? We talked about a speed study. Then we do travel time studies separately as well. So we do speed studies. And we do travel time studies, both, separately. Okay? Now what is the aim of doing travel time studies if you are already doing the speed study? Uh, travel time is a very important uh, parameter for the drivers. Okay? So you have to go to a place and you have two options. Two highways or two routes available. Which one would you select? The fastest. The fastest. So you are deciding on the basis of what? Okay, so if I ask you which highway is good as a driver, you will tell me, on, tell me on the basis of what? Time. So according to you, highway performance is what? Time. Okay, if my time is saved, then that, that is good for me, right? Okay, so travel time acts as a performance measure for the driver. They don't take average speed and traffic count and density and reason, right? This is the, these are the problems only with us, the traffic engineers. The drivers are free from it, okay? So this is from the point of view of the drivers. They consider travel time important when they are choosing their route or choosing their highway, okay? Now since it is important for the drivers, it becomes important for us as well. Because we design the highway according for the Drivers, right? You design the highways for the drivers, okay? So when you selected a particular highway, okay? This is good, huh? I am the only one. Nobody can come after me, huh? Okay. When you selected the highway, you became part of what? Demand, right? Okay. So our design of the highway should be according to demand, okay? So you must know how many drivers are part of the demand of the highway, right? Then you will select how many lanes there should be, what should be the design speed and so on, okay? And the demand is on the basis of what? Drivers are the demand, right? And how the drivers are selecting on the basis of? Okay, so travel time is a performance measure for the drivers and it is an input to calculate the demand for the traffic engineers. 
Okay, it's important for the drivers. It becomes important for us. If you don't know the travel time, you cannot calculate the demand. I mentioned the last chapter that if you just look at the volume on the road, it may not give you the actual demand because some drivers may not have come to the highway because there is a traffic jam. Okay, so if somebody tries to calculate the demand from the volume, it will be inaccurate. Okay, but so the more uh, accurate method of calculating the demand is using the travel time. Okay, you calculate the demand on the basis of travel time. Okay. Okay, so when you say I went from place A to place B, my travel time was one hour. Let's say. Okay. This one hour includes a delay, right? Maybe you stopped somewhere for 10 minutes. Okay. Maybe there was an accident, the highway was blocked, and you were stopped for 10, 15, 20 minutes. So that 10, 15, 20 minutes is part of the travel time, right? Okay. So how do we define delay then separately? What is delay? Uh -huh. Interruption. Yeah. Interruption. Interruption. Okay. A part of the problem. Which part of the problem? Which is uh, makes the uh, problem. Yeah. Which makes it up. You know what I'm asking? What is delay? Which part of the travel time would you call as delay? The time that the bus is stopping. Stopping time? Yes. Stopping time is part of the delay. Yes. But in the last chapter, we did one example where we calculated the delay because of the queue, right? Okay, so there was a queue and the queue was causing this, this much amount of delay. So is the queue always stopped or the queue can move as well? It can move, right? Queue can, obviously queue has to move, right? Hmm? So queue has to move. So while the queue is moving, you are still having delay, right? So what now, what is delay then? So queue, delay is, something more than stopping, right? You may be moving, but still this time could be part of your delay. So which part? Huh? Low speed. Low speed, yes. How do you compare? This is low speed, this is high speed. Huh? Less than design speed. We, can, we calculate delay on the basis of what was our design. Okay, we designed the road for 120 kilometers per hour. With 120 kilometers per hour, you need 15 minutes. So whatever is more than that is, right? You design the road for a particular speed, right? At that particular speed, you you will cross the road in this much time. Now whatever extra is cost is part of delay. Okay, and in if you want to experience it, this is the time when you are feeling like this person. Okay, like from the inside. I hope not from the outside. So it's very scary. So, that part of travel time where you are feeling annoyed, okay, where you, when do you feel annoyed? Okay, I, I can go faster, okay, but I am being slowed because of this person, okay, why is he not going slow, did he not see the yellow light, can he not see the other lane which is empty, why is he in front of me and so on, hmm? why he was born? Things like this. Okay. So while you are asking yourself these questions, you are experiencing delay. Okay. So delay is basically when you feel that you can go faster, but you are according to your expectation, you are going slowly. That is delay. Clear? Okay. And it can happen because of stopping at a signal. It can happen at a mid-block location as well. Anywhere where you feel you are being slowed because of some reason. Then we have density studies. What is density? Tell me. Because per unit length. Because per unit length. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I mentioned density cannot be measured directly. It cannot just come. Okay. So in the last chapter, we saw some equations to calculate density. So if you have flow, speed, spacing, things like this, you can calculate density. Okay. Uh, in here we are talking about doing density studies using a detector, a sensor. Okay. So we put a detector under the road, under the surface of the road. Uh, can somebody give me the name, the type of this detect detector which we point. put under the road? Point detector. Point detector. Okay. 
So the detector which is put under the surface of the ore is called as a point detector. Okay. So you have installed a point detector under the ore. Now what this detector will do for density? Whenever a car comes over the detector, it will record the time for which the car was over it. Okay. So this car comes over the detector and stays there for one minute. So it will record this time. The next car comes and it stays for two minutes. Again recorded. Okay. So whenever the car comes on the detector, it is recording the time. Okay. On the basis of this time, it will calculate O, occupancy. Okay. What is O? Occupancy. Okay. How do we calculate occupancy? It's a ratio of the time when the detector was occupied over the total time. Total time when the data was collected. You collected data for two hours. Okay, two hours means how many minutes? One, huh? one twenty minutes. Okay, so out of these one twenty minutes, the detector was occupied, let's say, for forty-five minutes. So O will be forty-five upon one twenty. Okay, clear? Okay. So O is the time for which the detector was occupied by any vehicle because it will not be occupied for 45 minutes by one vehicle, right? It will be different vehicles, they will keep on coming and going but whenever a vehicle comes, the detector starts recording the time. Okay, and you divide that time, the total time of occupancy by the total time of observation, total time of data collection. Okay, that will give you O. What are the other two parameters? We have LV which is length of vehicle length of the vehicle. Normally we take it as the average length of the car around 20 feet. Okay, LV normally taken as average length of the car which is 20 feet. And then we have LD which is the length of the detector. LD is the length of the detector. And you know the detector, right? You put it there. You already have the length. It's manufactured in a factory or something. You already have a fixed length. Clear? Yes. So occupancy is recorded by the detector, the ratio of time. LV, the length of the vehicle. LD, the length of the detector, which you should know. Clear? Okay. So using these three parameters, you can calculate density as well. Okay. So this is from field observations now, direct. Hmm. And then we have accident studies. So we collect accident data and try to study the characteristics of the accidents. Okay, which characteristics are important for us? Rate of accidents. Rate of accident meaning frequency per year. How many accidents per year we are having? Okay. What are the reasons of accidents, causes of accidents? Okay, the common reasons for accidents. Use of cell phone, driver sleeping, driver angry, whatever. Okay, so what are the common causes of accidents? And the locations in which accidents happen more often than others. Okay, there are certain locations on which accidents happen more often than others. Okay, for example, but it could be true, but in many cases it is the intersections. It is the intersections. Okay, why? Because the intersections and you have many crossings, right? Because of that. But it's just an example. Just an example. It, for a particular area, it could be a freeway, it could be a two lane highway, whatever. Okay, but we do these studies to know which one in this area, which type of location in this area is causing more accidents. Clear? Okay. Then we do parking studies. So we go and study the parking areas. Again, we have three important items here. In a parking study, there are three important items. We have inventory, we have accumulation, and we have demand. Inventory, accumulation, demand. Inventory of what? Inventory of parking supply. What do we mean by inventory? Inventory means what?
Best to solve something. Huh? Best to solve something. Store, yes, yes. A storage or record, okay? Record of what we have stored, okay? So inventory of what? Parking? Supply. What do we put? Supply in the parking. Ah, uh, cars in the back. Ah, uh, yes. What do we supply in the parking? Cars will use the parking, right? But what you are giving them? Space. Space, right? Parking is space. So inventory of parking supply means record of parking spaces. You think the thing? Record of parking spaces. Okay, and it should be a detailed record. Detail meaning what? Where are the parking spaces? Parking spaces could be at different location, right? Okay, some in front of the building, some behind the building, some in the basement, some at the first floor. Okay, and they could be of different types. Okay, so this parking space, uh, some parking spaces which are parallel, some parking spaces are perpendicular, some are inclined. Okay. So uh, an inventory should show how many parking spaces you have, where are they located, and what type they are. All these things. If somebody just says we have 100 parking spaces, the inventory is incomplete. The inventory is incomplete. To make it complete, we should tell you what type of parking spaces and where they are and so on. Clear? OK. Then we have accumulation. Accumulation is? Number of parking spaces occupied at a given time. Number of parking spaces occupied at a given time. You go to the parking area, you see if 50 spaces are occupied, this is accumulation. Okay? Then we have parking demand. Parking demand is number of people using the parking area in the in a time period in a time interval. Number of people using the parking area in a time period. Okay? Get it? Yes. Now tell me the difference between accumulation and demand. What are the differences between accumulation and demand? The demand is about area and the accumulation is about time. How? You just said that. Huh? I think you just said that. Yeah, yeah, but how? Yes, what's the difference between accumulation and demand? The main difference. It's related to time actually. What's the main difference between accumulation and demand? Accumulation increases when demand increases. What's the difference? Yes, yes, okay. Accumulation is number of spaces occupied and demand is how many people are using their spaces. Okay. Anything else? No? I told you accumulation is at a given time. So it's now. Okay. 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 11.30 at a given time. So accumulation right now. Demand is for the entire time interval. Demand is for the entire time interval. So if you go to the parking area and you just count the number of vehicles at that time, what do you have? Accumulation. It's not the demand. You cannot call it the demand. To have the actual demand, you have to stay there and see how many vehicles are coming in and going out for the entire time period. Okay? If the parking area is open for 10 hours. You will see how many cars are coming in and going out for the entire 10 hours. Clear? Okay? Got it? Yes. Repeat what? Accumulation is for a given time and uh, demand is for the entire time period. So at 11 o'clock, I have accumulation. But if you say uh, 100 cars, use the parking area between 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. This is demand. 
but how many were there at 8 am this is accumulation okay uh, in as part of parking studies we may have to sometimes do the interview of the drivers as well okay why uh, because we want to know the uh, choice of the drivers okay the preference of the driver and the attitude of the driver towards parking okay uh, as i already mentioned parking spaces can be at different locations right but they can be of different types okay so you may see okay we have we need more parking spaces let's say and then you increase the number of parking spaces but the new spaces are not used by anyone you have the same problem with the old spaces why because the new spaces which you created the drivers don't prefer that okay maybe there are people like me they don't want to do parallel parking or reverse parking something like this okay okay we have an entire building in uh, karachi it was built a long time ago and till the time i was there it was always more than half empty and that area is really really congested okay like just to walk there is a hassle there's not enough in space there to walk okay and that entire building which was for parking nobody was using it why some problem with the choice of the driver okay we will face the hassle we will park illegally whatever but this building is not suitable for us so how do you know we have to do some interviews okay so to know the choice or preference or attitude you cannot just observe it you have to ask okay so you will see interview studies and some of the other uh, studies as well then we have studies for goods movement and transit okay which vehicles are used for moving goods and materials and these things trucks trucks right and transit means public transport transit is public transport so which vehicles are used for public transport buses so trucks and buses both are what huh they are heavy vehicles okay so in many cases we want to study them separately why because you may have seen if you have two lanes and you see more trucks in one lane okay so you prefer to go in which lane the other one right okay now if you count the number of vehicles in both lanes the one with the trucks and the one without the trucks you may see the one which has trucks the number is actually less you may have only 20 trucks here and 50 cars there okay but the one with the 50 cars could be faster than the one with the 20 trucks because they are bigger and slower and so on okay so these heavy vehicles can cause congestion even with low numbers they can cause more congestion than cars even if they are less okay so we need to have an idea about again their inventory their record we need to have their record uh, in which areas they usually go what what is the timing of their trips and so on okay so if you go to industrial areas or port or educational area then you will see that uh, many of the uh, uh, many times the congestion is caused because of these vehicles okay so we need to do proper planning for these cases okay these are special cases then we have pedestrian studies as i mentioned in the last lecture and today as well traffic does not only mean vehicles traffic means people who are just traveling out of the vehicle so pedestrians then become an important part of the transportation system because they are there okay the most important characteristics for us related to pedestrians is their crossing crossing cross walk is written there but uh, we want to know from where they are crossing okay about the speed they are crossing and so on and so forth so our main concern is how to make the crossing of the pedestrians safer how to make sure that the pedestrians can cross the road safely this is our main concern okay so we do pedestrian studies to make sure about this concern okay uh, to address this concern 
We want to know from where they are crossing and so on. So the crossing location can be a signalized intersection, it can be an unsignalized intersection, or it can be the mid middle of the road. Okay? We don't have any restrictions like this. So you want to know uh, from where they are crossing and to you try to make it as safe as possible. And again, it can include some interview studies as well. Okay, so again, interview studies are done to do what? No, the choice, of the choice, the behavior, the attitude. Okay, so you want to know the, you know, you want, can ask the pedestrian, why are you crossing from here? Uh, why are you walking in the middle of the road like a madman and so on and so forth? Okay, so do you love your life or is your son to die? Things like this. Okay. Then we have calibration studies. Okay. We did a calibration study in the last chapter. What did we do? What am I calling as calibration? Huh? Yes. Tell me, tell me. The derivation. The derivation of equations, making relationships between variables and so on. Okay, so that is a calibration study. Okay, so to know how one parameter affects the other, we need to collect data. Then we see we see the graph, we see the equation, try to make the equation and so on and so forth. So doing all this is called as a calibration study, where you collect data and you see what is the relationship between different parameters of the data. Okay, and it can include making graphs and equations, just like what we did in the last chapter. Then we have observational studies. In the previous slides, uh, it was written as a follow-up study. What is a follow-up study? To check with the condition. Yes. You made any changes on the road. Now you want to see if uh, what are the results of these changes. Or what are the effects of these changes. How drivers are behaving in the new design, with the new design. Okay. Are they going faster, slower, more accidents, less accidents? more delay, less delay, less congestion, more congestion, so on and so forth, okay? So these are called as observational studies in which you, uh, which you do after a design change and you, the, the purpose is to find out the effects of that design on the uh, drivers. Okay, uh, the studies can be divided into three categories based upon the technique which you are using to collect the data. Based upon data collection technique, your study can be a manual study, a semi-automated study, or a fully automated study. Manual study means you are applying a manual technique. Semi-automated means you are applying semi-automated technique. Fully automated means you are applying a fully automated technique. Okay. So we start with the first one, which is the manual study. So you are applying a manual technique, right? So manual means what? You have to be on the side. You have to go on the side and you will collect the data, right? Now the problem is the duration of the study, the length of the study. How long should it be? Tell me. Give me an idea. How long can be can a manual study be? Short. Sure. How short? One hour. One hour? Maximum one hour. Huh? Less than one hour. What would you do in the project? Yes. 15 minutes. We go at different times. We what do you mean? At different times. What do you mean? Uh, go at uh, noon and then at the uh, afternoon, at the evening. Hmm. Okay. So you are saying one hour, right? Yes. What if it is longer? We will exhaust it from the. Yes. And then what will happen to the data? It will not be up there. It will not be accurate. Okay. So one thing everybody agrees on that the manual study should be short. Okay. And if you try to stretch it, then the accuracy of the data will go down. The person will get tired, he will be exhausted, and he is bound to make more mistakes, more errors. Agree? Yes. Okay. What are they saying? It should be how much? Less than 24 hours. So 23 hours is enough, right? Huh? 
can do 23 hours, right? Who can do 23 hours? This means what? You can do it? 15? Okay. Yes. So, but you get the idea that if there is the same person and you will doing it non-stop for a longer time, there will be more errors. Okay? In order to reduce the errors, we do it in shifts. If the time is longer, then we do it in shifts. If the time is longer. One hour is not long. Okay? You are young people. One hour is not long. Okay? So don't, don't play any tricks with the traffic, the project data. Okay? We'll do it for one hour. As simple as that. It will be in the end. Uh -huh. Very good. You feel like the class, right? Class is 15 minutes, that is one hour. Okay? So, you can manage. Okay. So, even in 24 hours, we do it in shifts. Okay? And the shorter the shift, it is better. What type of studies we can do manually? We can do traffic counting manually, right? Okay, most of you have done it on the weekend, right? Uh, a speed or travel time, if you have a stopwatch, you can do speed, travel time data, no problem. Observational studies, observational studies, what do they call it? What's the other name? Follow the shift. Okay. These studies are by nature very short. Why? Because you already made the change, right? And when you made the change, you were expecting something as a result. So you know where you made the change, why you made the change. So to see the effect is very short. To, to see the effect of uh, the change, it, it becomes easier for you. So I made a speed hump on this highway, on this occasion. The purpose was to reduce the speed. That's why looking at the 10, 15 minutes data, because you already have a previous data, remember? You already have the data before the change. So even if I collect the data for 10, 15 minutes after the change, it is enough. The results will be easier. Yeah. Okay, you know what what we are trying to you know evaluate. Okay, here the speed should be higher. Here the speed should be lower. Get, even if you are experienced enough, just by looking at the highway, you know there's a, is it, there's an effect or not. Are the drivers paying attention to the speed camera or the speed hump or not? You can just see and know. Okay, so if you made a change on an intersection, you just go there. That intersection has a problem or traffic jam. You can go there for 10 minutes and you know, is the traffic jam less or more, right? Okay, so these studies are very short by nature. Then we have delay studies at intersections. These studies are uh, very complex, okay? We'll discuss them in detail later on, okay? But because of their complexity, we do it manually. Delay studies, because of their complexity, we do it manually, okay? So we already mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, Manual studies should be short, okay? Uh, I showed you these counters in the previous lecture as well. So while the cars are going, you press on the button, the counter will record it, and once you finish the study, you can just take the number from here, from the counter, right? If you go back to the previous topic, the previous uh, 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 chapter which we did, you may remember there were, uh, the data was given at 15 minutes intervals. In some of the examples, the data was given at 15 minutes in the interval. First 15 minutes, these many vehicles. Next 15 minutes, these many vehicles, okay? So if you're using a counter, after 15 minutes, you have to do what? You have to write the value somewhere, and you have to reset it, okay? If you want the data after every 15 minutes, after every one hour, let's say. So one hour, again, you have to reset the counter, write the value somewhere. And if you're using pen and paper, you don't have the count. Then your paper may finish, you have something wrong with the pen, or you just want to drink water, check your notifications, whatever. Okay? So, you need, uh, the point is, uh, while you are resetting the counter, writing the number, what will happen to the vehicles? They are passing. They are missing the value, right? They are missing some of the values. Okay? So, what do we do? We uh, try to allocate a break time for the observer. And whatever he is doing, or whatever he needs to do, he will do it in the break time. Okay? Whatever he needs to do, changing of the sheets, 
resetting the counter, drinking water, uh, making an emergency call, whatever. He will do it in the break time. You give him or you specify for him a break time. This is your break time. Okay, whatever you do, do it in this time. Okay, so that we know exactly how much time he has lost. The purpose of allocating a break time is we want to know exactly how much time he was spending in these things. Okay, otherwise it will be random. Now it is one minute. Next time it will be two minutes or five minutes. We don't know. Okay, otherwise you have to put an observer for the observer. Huh? See how much time he is wasting. We cannot do this. So we specify a break time for him. You can, you are allowed to waste this much time. Okay, this break time can be given in two ways. Break as part of the counting period or break as an alternate period. The break which you are giving to the observer, it can be part of the counting period or an alternate period. What do you mean? When the break is part of the counting period, you tell him the total time and of total time of counting. And in this time, you tell him this much part is your break. You tell him your total time is 15 minutes. In the 15 minutes, 3 minutes are your break. Okay? So the counting time is more, the break time is? Yes. Okay? This is break within counting. The counting period. And then you can have alternate breaks as well. Alternate break periods as well. So he will count for, let's say the counting period is 15 minutes. He will count for 15 minutes, then break for 15 minutes. Again, count for 15, break for 15. Got it? So the counting and break periods are what? Equal. Okay? Now, what do I do with the data with the breaks? The data is not complete, right? I have to fill the data. So what, how, what do I do? For example, he took the data for Y number of, sorry. I need the data for Y number of minutes. So let's say I need the data for 15 minutes. So Y is what? 15. He took the data for X number of minutes. So let's say his break is 3 minutes. So he is taking the data for 12 minutes, right? So X is 12. V is the data he took in 12 minutes. Or in X number of minutes. Okay, so how do I get the full data? V divided by X. It will become per minute, right? And then I multiply by the number of minutes I want. Clear? Data upon number of minutes, he counted. Multiply by number of minutes, you want. Okay. So if it is 12 minutes counting and 15 minutes data required, V upon 12 into 15. Clear? Clear? And the last thing, if it is alternate. Alternate means what? He has a, a value for some number of minutes. Then he has a break for same number of minutes and then he has a count for same number of minutes. Now I need the middle value. What do I do? I have a value before, I have a value after. In the, in the middle you take average or you interpret, right? So this is what we are doing. Value before, value after. Just take an average. Clear? So if the break is within counting period, this thing. If the break is alternate, then this thing. Any questions? Any problems? Clear?